Thank you so much for coming to this summit, the Future of Science in America Summit. So now that election day is behind us, we are eager to discuss the high stakes ahead for science and policy as we conclude an extremely difficult and at times devastating year and as we approach 2021. Next slide, please. I'm Kira Peacock, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Leaps Mag. It's an award-winning digital magazine about scientific innovation, ethics, and the future of humanity. Our ambition is to catalyze a movement to critically impact how the public views scientific innovation. We're published by Good and Upworthy, and we're grateful for program support from Leaps by Bayer. We're thrilled to partner with the Aspen Institute Science and Society program for this event. I'm Aaron Mertz, and I'm the founding director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society program, part of the Institute's broader health, medicine, and society program. Science and Society was established in 2019 with the mission to elevate public trust in science and to help foster a more diverse and engaged scientific workforce. Next slide. We'd like to acknowledge the generous foundations which have made this event possible, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and the Rita Allen Foundation. We'd also like to thank the general supporters of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program and Leafs Mag. Next slide. This event actually accompanies a magazine that Aspen and Leaps Mag and Good co-published last month titled The Future of Science in America, The Election Issue. The magazine aspires to promote roadmaps for science as a tool for health, as a vehicle for progress, and as a unifier of our nation. We were thrilled that it was recently very positively reviewed in the Washington Post, and you can read it for free on Leaps Mag and Aspen Institute's websites. And here are just a number of the articles uh, that you can view online if you check out the magazine. Next slide. We're thrilled to have a stellar lineup of experts today who will discuss the future of science in this country. The format for the summit is rotating paired conversations during which two experts will speak for approximately eight minutes before we move to the next pair. At the end of the five conversations, we will bring all of the speakers back for public Q&A. You can submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we'll conclude the summit at 1.10 p.m. Eastern time. We also have the chat feature open for all attendees if people wish to react to the discussion and or share information. Next slide. To give more time to the speaker's insights, we will not be reading their biographies, but rather refer you to the registration page that lists their titles. And we'll be timing each conversation for eight minutes and we'll give notice with, when there's about 30 seconds remaining in each conversation. Our first pairing is Dr. Michelle McMurray-Heath from BIO and Dr. France Cordova, the former director of the National Science Foundation. So I'm interested uh, Francis, and, and how you're seeing this impacting science funding. I mean, we've seen completely new models for scientific funding um, in 2019 and 2020. What do you, what does this portend for the future? Um, the, you mean the, the COVID um, situation, how that's impacting science funding, Michelle? Exactly. Yeah, well, the, um, I think all the uh, federal science agencies are very busy um, with uh, receiving proposals and reviewing them, and they're doing an admirable job in this. Uh, they're, they're doing it um, mostly uh, at home, uh, virtually. I know uh, National Science Foundation, with which I'm most familiar, is almost totally um, doing it uh, the uh, reviews and uh, and awards uh, remotely, and um, they're they're just getting out a tremendous number of awards. When you just look at the statistics, it's even better than a year ago. Perhaps because they have more time to focus, uh, and um, I I think that it's uh, working out uh, very well for that uh, particular agency to receive a lot of us to get the funding out. I think uh, also I've been much more involved in the philanthropic world uh, since uh, uh, finishing my term at the National Science Foundation. And there too, uh, the foundations are really stepping up. I know uh, the Science Philanthropy Alliance 
uh, for which I'm a senior science advisor, is uh, doing a lot to encourage the funding of basic uh, research and uh, has over 30 foundations as part of it. And uh, the foundations are really stepping up, realizing the uh, tremendous importance of the continuity of science funding. Wonderful. So, you know, there've been so many allegations of political interference in um, science funding and the, the COVID related projects and agendas um, through this last year. Can public trust in science agencies further the progress of science to the benefit of the public? Well, that's a really important question, Michelle. Science, of course, is about a search for truth. It's essential that the public trust the science agencies to fulfill their missions, which have been authorized and funded and have oversight from Congress, which of course are the elected representatives of the people. So I, I think that the future of science in America depends on scientific integrity and relies on the trust of its citizens. Uh, you're right, there, there have been allegations of political interference in the agenda or projects supported by some federal agencies. Only this morning, I was reading um, a uh, missive by the CEO of Sigma Psi, a scientific research honor society, about how protection should be established to preserve scientific integrity in federal science. I know the Union of Concerned Science just echoes that and many media outlets, including those of the scientific societies have uh, reported various instances. And I think that the fact that so many are concerned about that, these allegations and that Congress is clearly concerned is a healthy sign that the public wants to ensure trust in the science agencies. They wanna hold them accountable, want them to be transparent and forthcoming about what they know. And that's a good thing for our democracies. I know many of the agencies have scientific integrity policies in place. The National Science Foundation is one of them. And um, in my term of six years, NSF uh, didn't really suffer from political interference. Oh, we had lists in, in congressional waste books and all, which we carefully uh, defended. But um, we were able to maintain our mission to further the progress of science. Although, of course, as an executive branch agency, as the science agencies are, we're sensitive to the priorities of different administrations. In 2010, the uh, White House memorandum laid out the basic principles for the development and implementation of scientific integrity policies at all the agencies and many of them had published uh, a few years later the scientific integrity policies that were consistent with the intent of that memo. Unfortunately, a government accountability office study found that there was an uneven application and oversight of the policy and found that uh, a number of departments had failed to monitor compliance with the policy. So we have a ways to go. And Congress, I know, is very actively proposing requirements for scientific integrity among the agencies. Um, for example, there's a, a bill in March of 2019 from the House Science, Space and Technology Committee that would recodify existing federal activities related to scientific integrity and uh, requires scientific training programs on integrity and so on. And it had uh, a, almost 200 supporters uh, in Congress. I think that this issue that you bring up is going to really come to the fore with the new administration. It's an important one. Mm. You know, part of what we've been seeing in terms of public confidence in a potential COVID vaccine and the science around responding to COVID is public discomfort with how science can seem to understand something one day or seem to be going in a direction and then face a setback. How do you think we can better educate the public on the scientific pro process and how you sometimes take two steps forward and one step back or vice versa? Well, I, I think um, that, that, that too is a, a superb question. I, I think COVID uh, really brings that question to the fore and just um, opens it up. And people are who perhaps didn't think deeply about the scientific process and were confused about um, why weren't there absolutes that we have 
you know, a cure for this, or we, we said we were going in this direction, why did it take us such a long time? Why didn't we get there? Um, that, that the whole progress with, with COVID, with understanding its, its genesis, understanding treatments, understanding um, how to do the, the whole data analysis and, and contacts, and, um, and now, of course, the all-important vaccines. Um, that um, their, their understanding that, that it takes a, a, a careful long time for uh, science to address uh, really important big milestones, big goals. Um, we had a number of examples um, at the National Science Foundation, which we, uh, that were tremendous breakthroughs that made the covers of things like Science Magazine and, and newspapers all over the world, like the discovery of gravitational waves on Earth, the imaging of the black hole, and so on, that we were careful to report that these took decades, really, to come to fruition, and teamwork, global teamwork. And so um, I, I think that, that there is more of an effort on the part of scientists and engineers and the, the science agencies of everyone and, and media publications to really uh, reinforce uh, how long it, it takes and the different steps in, 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 um, in the whole process of the truth. About 30 seconds remaining in this conversation. So um, we're in the midst, not everyone agrees, but we're in the midst of a presidential transition season. And I participated in the Obama transition team for NSF many years ago. What would be your advice to the transition team coming in to look at NSF right now? Uh, so um, the, I, I, I think the agency is just remarkable in its um, goals, in its progress, in its team that has people uh, exceptionally committed to the mission of the agency. And uh, my advice was to is do no harm. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful agency. We want to always encourage more young people to get involved in science. And I think that the NSF in particular, through its merit review process, is an invitation to, uh, to young people to find out what it's like to submit a great proposal to help review them and all, and uh, to be a part of the entire spectrum of science and engineering. Wonderful, thanks. Thank you. We're gonna bring Dr. McMurray Heath back at the end for her second conversation. And now we're delighted to have Seema Kumar, who's the global head of the Office of Innovation, Global Health and, Pol and Scientific Engagement at Johnson & Johnson. Hi. Hello, hello Seema, welcome uh, to this forum. So Johnson & Johnson, so I hear you're busy working on a vaccine and can you tell us a little bit about it and also some of the questions people have about you know, the equitable delivery of, uh, of a vaccine and where, where is Johnson Johnson and the whole spectrum of this race to get a, a, a vaccine and what are some of the other challenges are you considering on the, the road to making sure that uh, the US indeed the whole world has access to it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased to talk about it and it's been 24 seven since the beginning of this year, when the sequence uh, of the coronavirus became available in January. And so since then, you know, teams across Johnson & Johnson have been working fast and furious. Ours is a vaccine that is, um, uh, uses a platform called the Adeno Vector Platform. And so basically um, this particular platform is the same platform that we've used. In many of the other vaccines that we've studied, um, including um, the one that we developed for Zika, but we never actually launched it because Zika kind of disappeared uh, and the same vaccine is being used um, in the HIV um, arena. Uh, the HIV vaccine is in uh, phase three clinical trials across the world and also in RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. And so, and Ebola, the Ebola vaccine was approved by the European Union uh, last year. So this is the, the to say that the, we've had this platform, um, we have a huge vaccine expertise. So we, the, we just jumped on it immediately. And where we are today is really, is, it's in uh, phase three and the studies are ongoing uh, all across the world. The um, studies are ongoing in, in the United States, in Latin America, in South Africa, and in many countries in Europe. And uh, it's, a, it's a single dose vaccine. 
Um, so you, you, it, it's, um, you know, fingers crossed, we're hoping to get see the results soon. And our goal is to actually have the first batches of the vaccines available for emergency use authorization in, the, in early January uh, 2021. And we hope to make a billion vaccines per year. And our commitment is to make it available for a not-for-profit price um, across the world. So in addition to working uh, with governments um, you know, all across the, the, um, the globe uh, in terms of equitable access, as well as distribution of the vaccine, uh, we're also working with uh, um, many other uh, actors uh, in, and recently made a commitment to allocate uh, a portion of our um, vaccine uh, lots, even as early as next year, um, to the lower uh, and lower middle income countries and low income countries. Um, this is a commitment that we made at the UN General Assembly, uh, uh, where the um, uh, G7 was meeting and making commitments to equitable access um, across the world. So uh, eagerly looking forward to the results and, um, you know, hoping to make a, a big difference for the world. Well, well, that's just wonderful. I'm sure everybody's just really delighted to hear that. I know you're the global head of innovation at Johnson & Johnson, and uh, where I've seen you last has been in, in, in Africa, uh, trying to encourage young people through something called the Next Einstein uh, Forum to become scientists and engineers. And I personally think that the future of science in America depends on the future of science in the whole world and, uh, and how we interact uh, engage with the whole world in making progress in science. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, your efforts uh, globally in encouraging uh, young people to become the next Einstein, the next Madame Curie and all? Uh, yeah, no, I think, you know, as, as you may know, Johnson & Johnson is a global healthcare company. So we have offices and our products and our researchers, you know, across the world. So it's a global network of, of people uh, and products. And, uh, and, you know, just as we think about the Johnson & Johnson pipeline, and today I know everybody's mind is on COVID, but we have a large pipeline of multiple different things for medical solutions and medical devices in, in pharmaceuticals, as well as in, in consumer healthcare. Uh, as we think about all of that, and we always think about the pipeline because we want to be sure that there's a robust pipeline that's coming behind from an R&D perspective. Similarly, we need a robust pipeline of people and the diversity of ideas from across the world is what sparks innovation. And I think we all believe and know that um, science is not an individual um, activity, it's a team sport, but it's also an international collaborative enterprise. And so with that, I think that our goal always is to, um, our philosophy is that a great idea can come from anywhere or anyone. And, uh, you know, we have to be prepared to actually pounce on those ideas because in those ideas uh, are the solutions to make the world a better place. That's, that's just great. So where do you see um, uh, innovation really being uh, required in, in what you do? Where, where, you know, if you could uh, fund um, uh, others to, to, to really encourage uh, innovation, both here and abroad, where, where do you think we have the biggest need for more innovation? Well, I think we, uh, I think it's all across the globe in terms of um, uh, disease states, because I think that on the one hand, we're focused on public health solutions and infectious diseases, and there's a huge need, continues to remain a huge need in infectious diseases, but the non-communicable diseases are also uh, of great importance, of course, cancer, heart disease, um, Alzheimer's. I mean, you know, as of last year before COVID, we all thought that that was the next um, ticking time bomb. It probably still is. I think uh, as we continue to age and, uh, and we have an aging population across the globe, that's another area that, and the brain sciences still remains a black box. So if I think across um, you know, the, the, the whole landscape, um, we, we've come a long way in, in, in healthcare, 
but there are still big major challenges to be solved and these don't recognize um, national boundaries. Um, you know, they are just human specific. So Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, cancer still remains a huge, huge issue. And in that arena, I think we're really excited about CAR T therapies um, and also gene therapies. Um, but I think ultimately where we will all land is probably in a, in a place where we want more innovation is that personalized medicine uh, future that we all imagined. Um, 30 and seconds so, remaining. So, uh, so the future I think uh, is, is in personalized medicine, but also in personalized healthcare, but also in the hands of young scientists all over the world whose ideas we will need to solve the big major challenges in healthcare. Great, well, thank you very much, Seema. It's been fascinating listening to you and good luck with that vaccine thank development. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Now joining Seema Kumar will be Joseph DeRisi, who's a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF and co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Biohub. Hi, Joe. Great Hi. to see you. I don't see you yet on yes, my screen. Ah, there you are. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. So Chan Zuckerberg Institute and their biohub, I mean, it's a very interdisciplinary type of innovative uh, approach to solving problems. What's the latest? What are, what are some of the things that you're working on now? Sure. So uh, just to be clear, there's two organizations, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. I'm with the Biohub. They're actually two separate organizations. Uh, we're a, a 501c3 nonprofit research institute associated with UC Berkeley, Stanford, and UCSF. And, you know, in this times of COVID, well, it's, it, you, you know, you're asking what are we working on or what were we working on pre-COVID? And it's actually kind of ironic. Pre-COVID, you know, the Biohub, together with CZI and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we were working actually on a worldwide early warning radar system for emerging infectious disease. Kind of ironic. Mm -hmm. So yep. the idea, right, was to leverage microbiology infrastructure in low and middle income countries by equipping them with the latest in sort of genomic technologies training. Now, the issue with that is that counterintuitively, the price of analyzing data has actually gone up while the cost to actually process samples and make sequences has gone down. Mm -hmm. So our solution to that, right, like what's good is, what good is the data if you can't analyze it? Our solution to that was a system called IDSeq. This is all pre-COVID now. Mm -hmm. And it's basically a team of data scientists and bioinformaticians in software. And it enables folks in their own country to analyze samples from people, insects, livestock, plants, the environment, whatever you want. And IDSeq acts to aggregate and centralize real-time analysis of that data, basically making an emerging pathogen dashboard for the world, right? That was the idea. Yeah. And in early January, the first week of January, I was in Cambodia. I was in Phnom Penh with the team helping to set up the system there. Mm -hmm. And it was with the Pasteur Institute there that the team in Cambodia used the system to detect one of the first Chinese tourists with COVID in the whole country, the first infection mm -hmm. actually in Cambodia, and was wow. able to sequence that genome in mid-January, very early on in this pandemic. And we thought, oh, great, the system's working, you know, this thing probably won't go far past Asia. You know, uh, uh, we were badly wrong in that, obviously. And so now fast forward to March, where are we now? And what, what are we turning our attention to? So we basically made a huge pivot. Everything we do now is all COVID all the time. Mm -hmm. We first spun up clinical yeah. lab testing here in the Bay Area to address the sort of the dearth of testing for our most vulnerable populations. Yep. safety net clinics, prisons, jails, skilled nursing facilities, et cetera. But more than that, we actually then deployed our genomic sequencing technology to be uh, more actionable and useful. That mm -hmm. is, you know, every time uh, or every two to three times COVID jumps from person to person, a mutation is introduced in the genome, pretty much randomly. Mm -hmm. Some not so random, but mostly randomly. Mm -hmm. And this effectively leaves a breadcrumb trail in the genome that mm -hmm. allows you to trace back where the virus has been. Hmm. And so 
this is an amazing tool. And so together with the, the Department of Health, CDPH here in the state and our local county partners, we've been sequencing all the COVID genomes we can get and then returning that information back to the counties in a way to make the information imminently actionable. So for example, you may ask like, how, how does that actually work? So imagine that you have two skilled nursing facilities, both of which had outbreaks. Our, and this actually, this is a real example, but I'm not gonna name names obviously. In the sequence data, we saw that they shared identical genomes, but mm -hmm. they're, they're geographically distant from each other. And we know that they didn't share patients. Yeah. So it immediately led to the conclusion that they had to share employees. Yeah. And then the Department of Health was able to find the linkages between these facilities to cut transmission chains short. We need to use every scrap of information we have right now to stop the forward transmission of virus. And that's what we're turning our technology to. I mean, and, uh, and you know, we, with Thanksgiving coming up and the holiday season coming up and all, there's already a spike in COVID cases, it's gonna go even higher. So, I mean, the technology that you're talking about, I mean, it sounds amazing. Uh, it sounds almost science fiction-like, which is fabulous. So given that, why is it that in America where you know, we're scientifically and technologically some of the most advanced nations, um, having so much uh, trouble in preventing transmission? Well, that's a, there's a lot to unpack in that question. <laughs> you know, one of the issues here, and you know, there are many issues ranging from political all the way down to sort of organizational, but let me address some of the obvious ones right off the bat. And I can speak mostly for California. We're, we're a state of 58 counties. Each county has its own Department of Public Health that has its own health authority and jurisdictions. And therefore you have 58 different sets of rules, 58 different ways of doing things, 58 potentially different information systems. So even just transmitting information among counties is hard. In fact, we had a conversation with one of our departments of public health and says, if you get anything you want right now, a big shiny new testing machine, more people, what would it be? And the officer said, information. I need information. And our inability to move information around and to coordinate among the counties makes us uniquely unprepared for a pandemic, which doesn't give a hoot about county borders. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, if you think about even contact tracing, um, we haven't been able to sort of deploy technology the way some other places have deployed technology. Let me switch gears for a second. I mean, clearly, you know, some really leading edge work going on, um, you know, all around the country. What role can academic private sector collaboration play um, in this pandemic, but also in the future? And how is that important to the future of science in America? Yeah, sure. So, you know, in a situation like a pandemic, I really feel it's all hands on deck. You need to do what you have to do to get the job done. That's why we dropped all of our research projects. I don't care what people were working on before, today you work on COVID. And we turned all of our attention to addressing what the problem at the moment had to be. So that's why we spun up a testing laboratory. You know, we got a lot of criticism. Well, you know, there's a LabQuest and a core out there. There's a Quest and a LabCorp, you know, company out there. Why are you doing that? That's because we knew that the search would overcome everybody's capacity. Yeah. And so everybody has a responsibility, I think, in academia and in the nonprofit sector who are in science to step up and do what they can in the moment of the emergency to the best of their ability, because you can't sit back and wait for the cavalry to come. Because if there's anything we learned in this pandemic, no one's coming. About 30 seconds remaining. So you've worked in infectious diseases. You know, I think back to HIV and I think back to now. This is collaboration on a massive scale across, you know, scientific borders, across academic private sector borders. What can we learn from this sort of collaboration? Well, I hope that the lessons we learn are, are those that, that persevere. I mean, many of these learns were actually, many of these lessons were learned in the 1918 pandemic, but were forgotten over the decades. We need to relearn how to work together and transmit data information in real time in a way that's useful to everybody and to have coordination across public health authorities, which right now we don't. And I hope that we learn to use these tools and technologies that are developed to now attack the things that prior to COVID really weren't getting the attention that they deserved. 
tuberculosis, malaria. You mentioned RSV. We still don't have an operational vaccine or drug for RSV. That would be amazing. And I hope, I hope we have a bright future because of this. And I hope the lessons of this pandemic will not be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. And such a great note to end on. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate your joining us. Thank you both. Now we're joined by Saad Amir, who is the founder of Plus One Vote, a nonprofit organization dedicated to getting out the vote on issues such as climate change. Hi, Saad. Hello. Hello. How are you Thanks. doing, Dr. Yes. Professor? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I have a question for you. So now that the election's behind us, <laughs> uh, what, what are the next priorities for you and your peers who are committed to climate change and equality? Yeah, so I'd love to think that the election is behind us, but you know, aside from the ongoing struggle of um, you know conceding what the results were, and the results are what the results are, you know, Joe Biden is our president elect. Um, you know, I want to also highlight the fact that the election, in many ways, is not over, and I want to put a particular highlight onto the Senate runoffs that are happening in Georgia. Um, you know, right now what we're seeing is that the control of the Senate will come down to what happens in Georgia. There are two Senate races in Georgia where, you know, the, the control of the Senate will come down to that. And in many ways, the ability for Biden to have a cooperative Senate will determine what he's able to do on science policy, whether it be for coronavirus or for climate change. And so um, I want to make sure that we highlight that that is not over and that uh, our mission at Plus One Vote is to make sure that we get as many people on the ground in Georgia to go out and vote um, for that Senate runoff. Um, but you know, when it comes to climate change, I think what we've seen over the last few years has been fairly cat cataclysmic in America in terms of what we're doing for climate change. Um, you know, one, I want to say, like, I'm glad that even in this conversation of, of all the science stuff that we're having climate change brought up, I think a lot of the focus of the science community has gone to coronavirus and, and rightly so, but we can't ignore this looming crisis that we have. You know, I'm, uh, in addition to my work at Plus One Vote, I'm also an expert reviewer for the upcoming IPCC AR6 report. And, you know, the IPCC makes it very clear that we need to reduce our carbon emissions in half by 2030. And what that results in, what that looks like is essentially a seven and a half percent reduction in emissions every year from 2020 to 2030 and it's 2020 <laughs> we didn't do anything um, <clears throat> you know and so we're nowhere on track of where we need to be to reduce our carbon emissions to be able to reach a, a limited two degree warming in global temperatures and I think the United States in particular for talking about the future of science in America has gone backward in a lot of climate policy from rolling back protections for clean air, clean water, clean car rolls, methane emissions over the last few years. And as we're going forward, what we really need to see is a much more aggressive effort to, to push forward an agenda and on climate change. And you know what we've seen is Vice President-elect Joe Biden already say that he is going to re-enter the Paris Accord. But I want to note for everybody here that the that's largely a symbolic gesture. Globally, the Paris Accord has done very little to actually limit our global emissions. Even in the midst of this pandemic, which, you know, with a lot of industries stopping, one would expect our emissions to significantly have reduced, but not to the levels of what we what we need to see. And so I think that there's this sort of disconnect between what the science makes clear of what needs to happen on climate change and climate action and what we're seeing in terms of the political realities of America. And I am skeptical, my peers as well are skeptical that we are equipped to handle the situation if we continue to go at it from what we've seen over the past few years or even before that, because we're not going to be able to address the climate crisis uh, in a significant, meaningful way through a series of just, you know, executive orders that are just kind of shoved through and, you know, not really done, uh, followed through in a co co coherent effort on the ground, uh, you know, across utilities, across the private sector, across transportation in the United States. Right. So let's, let's be provocative for a minute. Let's say that the Senate is not 
uh, is not uh, in the Democrats' hands. And um, what can the Biden administration do realistically in that situation on the climate change issue? Sure. So even in the incidents where, you know, right now, obviously, the presidency is Biden and Auntie Mamala is our vice president as well. Um, you know, and then the Congress is with the Democrats. Um, and if the the Senate does not go to Democrats. There's still a large potential to take action, uh, limited though it will be. So, you know, there's the ability for Biden to establish a climate mobilization office. You know, I think what we need to see is a larger level um, coherent effort to specifically fight the climate crisis that works across, um, you know, the treasury, labor, energy, transportation, agriculture, interior, um, uh, you know, across these different sectors uh, in a, you know, as we know, climate is a threat multiplier. It, it not only, you know, increases temperatures, but it impacts our food, it impacts our water, it impacts our air, it impacts education, it impacts those that are most vulnerable, the indigenous black people, people of color. Um, and so we, as well as jobs in our economy. So we really need to have a more coherent, consistent way of bringing those different um, entities together. And Biden would have the ability to do that by creating an additional office, as well as, you know, appointing a director in his cabinet of climate change. We've never really seen anything like that. And I think that would be really important. He can also get us back into the Paris Accord through executive order, um, again, some, on a symbolic gesture, and can declare a climate emergency. Now, of course, as we may remember, the United States and many other nations around the world have, you know, often declared climate emergencies, um, but those threats have not necessarily been taken particularly seriously, as we've seen by literally people doing nothing. It, it, it then ends up being a lot of lip service. Um, and I think what the reality is that we're at the point of climate change where we can't have any more inaction. And every year that we don't reduce emissions, emissions are increasing. And so every year where we don't reduce emissions, not only are those emissions increasing, but our net cumulative emissions in the atmosphere are also increasing. So each year it gets significantly worse and our ability to handle this crisis is also getting worse, you know? So I think Biden has the ability to do all those things. In addition to, you know, when we talk about whether it's coronavirus or climate change, we know that these crises impact the most vulnerable communities the most intensely. And so I think he also has the ability to really highlight those issues and whether we're distributing a vaccine or taking care of, um, you know, different developments of fossil fuels uh, and other environmental injustice issues, he has the ability to highlight and prioritize those communities that have suffered the most. So I think that there's a lot that he can do. Um, in particular, you know, I think during uh, the last, I believe the last presidential debate, fracking became a big thing. About uh, 30 big, seconds remaining. A big center of the conversation. And I want to emphasize that if we're going to reduce our emissions, we can't be creating new fossil fuel developments, especially with the understanding that all of those things, every pipeline that's under, you know, under um, potential, or under proposal, would ultimately, you know, is by projection set out to be out for 20, 30 years, not to just be shut down in two or three years. So I think we have to be very cognizant of what he's doing and continue to push for um, President-elect Joe Biden to push for more progressive and more action-oriented things. I don't think we can keep waiting until 2030, 2050. Like, what can you do in your first 100 days in office to put us on a pathway that will reduce emissions 7.5% the this year is really what we need to see from joe biden great looking forward to that thank you both now we're going to bring back dr mcmurray heath hello dr mcmurray heath thank you for <laughs> staying on here with us um no problem so you are kind of a boss, you know, you have thousands of people um, at BIOS who've been really doing a lot of the work in, you know, development and research on COVID, coronavirus, uh, in vaccines. What's underway? What can we look under, uh, look forward to seeing? Obviously, the Pfizer vaccine um, developments have been a big thing in the news the past few days, but can you give me the low on, on what's, what's to come? 
Sure, sure. Well, we have a small but mighty team at Bio, but we are a membership organization. So the Biotechnology Innovation Organization represents a thousand member companies, all in biotech, of course, across healthcare, agriculture, and environment. So I was very interested uh, to hear your comments on the environment because we think it's incredibly important and environmental justice is so key. Um, and a part of making sure that we have a more equitable society is also making sure that we have scientific breakthroughs in all of those areas that reach communities in need most effectively and immediately. Um, and in COVID, the response by our member companies has been amazing. Just in the 10 months um, since the pandemic really came onto the stage, our companies have started over 800 research and development programs, all focused at finding um, therapeutics or vaccines to fight COVID. 191 COVID vaccines are actually in development. We hear a lot about the top 10 that are in the final clinical stages and that's very important that they're there. The news this week from Pfizer showing that their vaccine is showing incredible efficacy. The news last night from Moderna that their vaccine is shortly behind and also doing well was great news. But it's important to keep in mind that we're also working on a lot of promising therapeutics. And just this week, we got an emergency use authorization, which allows for limited use of um, Lilly's antibody cocktail um, to combat COVID. So all of these are building blocks towards getting that real armament we'll need for a really concerted response. Now, it would be ideal if we had our biotechnology responses married to very sound and comprehensive public health measures as well to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, and hopefully more of that will be to come. Um, but know that biotechnology is not uh, asleep at the wheel. It is really going out full force to try to help us uh, combat this. Absolutely. And I think there have been some, like you said, some really incredible developments um, that are not the ones that are highlighted in the news, but still are helping us treat even the impacts of coronavirus. Um, what do you think is sort of the biggest challenge in, in public health right now that you think needs to be overcome for you to be able to even use these technologies that you're developing in an effective way? Mm. Well, the biggest unknown hanging out there that I hear from a lot of our member companies is uncertainty um, at the federal level, to be quite honest. We really need to see a smooth transition between administrations to ensure that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which has been pivotal to this effort and really is responsible for declaring whether or not any of these new therapies or vaccines are safe and effective, continues to have steady, uninterrupted leadership. The same for the Centers for Disease Con Control and Prevention, which have developed the entire distribution protocol for um, COVID vaccines. So they will be critical in not just mapping out who should get the vaccines first, but how we will actually physically get it to all the locations we'll need it around the country. So those sorts of efforts cannot flag. They cannot wait on politics. Um, we really have to put patients first in this whole enterprise. Absolutely. And I, and I think as we're looking at the world right now, we're seeing a massive, massive spike in coronavirus right now. I'm not leaving my house. I'm fine on this Zoom call. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I think that's going to continue for like the next several months. Obviously, the holidays are coming together. We're all trying to, you know, get together for Thanksgiving and then Christmas and all that. Um, you know, how do you think that that will play a role into the work that you are doing with BIOS? Mm. Well, it certainly hit home for everyone. You know, our scientists are not immune from, you know, missing their families and fearing for their children and trying to homeschool. Everyone is working through these restrictions and new realities. And so I think every, all of the scientists working in the front lines in our, in our companies are aware of the urgency and want to do everything they can to get these solutions out as fast as possible. But it is going to be a hard season. I mean, we are used to being together as Americans at this time of year, mm -hmm. not just um, in the December holidays, but also at Thanksgiving. And this is going to be a virtual celebration nationally and we'll have to find a way to keep hitting home the importance of mask wearing, social distancing, limiting social gatherings, and, and not traveling if it's not absolutely necessary, because we still are not out of the woods, even though we see some promising biotech breakthroughs. 
And so you have done work for the Obama administration. Um, you know, you also worked at the FDA. Do you have any advice for incoming Vice President Joe Biden of what he can do to combat coronavirus and implement these solutions that you're creating? Well, you know, one of the most interesting things I see in the conversations about how to gear up for transition is, you know, this, this fear of involving a lot of folks that are really in the front lines of working um, towards these solutions. What we do, for example, in the Food and Drug Administration and what we do in our, um, in our companies that are developing these products and bringing them all the way to the patient bedside is pretty unique. You don't see it in academia, you don't see it in federal labs. It's really a unique body of knowledge. And so I hope that as we are bringing stakeholders together around the table, that we include that body of knowledge um, in making sure. We've seen it with, with Operation Warp Speed. Um, one of the leaders of that has a long history of really being able to deliver um, new drugs and solutions to patients. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we need to make sure that we see as well. So I have, I'm very optimistic. I have hopes that um, it's going to be a great new day, but there is a lot of work still yet to be done. Absolutely. I mean, please, we need those solutions. I'm trying to go out with my friends. It is not, we need to fix this <laughs> pandemic, guys. I thought this, at first I was like, is this going to be one or two weeks, one or two months? And now is this like one or two years? I don't Isn't know. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I mean, you, you, you got ready to sit in your house for like a month or so and you look up and three or four months have passed and now even more. About 30 and seconds. It's incredible. Me. It's so incredible. do you have one final takeaway of your research from BIOS that you want everyone to walk away from here and just remember? Yes, that the COVID vaccines have been through more scrutiny and more examination than almost any vaccine in history. And so while I know folks are worried about the politicization of science, know that there are so many eyes on this process that when we get vaccines out to patients, they're going to be some of the most trusted vaccines ever developed. And that is important for us all to remember as we want to try to return our country to normal. Let's get those vaccines, fam. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Great. Thank you both. Now we're going to bring back all five of the speakers. We have about 20 minutes remaining for public Q&A, which we've been monitoring. So please continue to contribute your questions there. Um, I'm going to ask the first one that came in from Natalia Shulga. Um, and this can go to anyone who wants to chime in. What kind of concerted effort should be made to bring voice of scientists to the political body? Should it be new alliances uh, or parallel efforts? And how should this be done? Maybe Michelle, we want to go first since you guys are doing something in that arena. Sure. You know, scientists are never shy to volunteer. And Seema and I have had the privilege of working together before. And scientists have great um, knowledge to bring to bear. And we're trying to renew scientific pride. Um, I think there's been you know, disparagement a, a lot of the scientists that work in industry to bring solutions to patients. And it's important to understand that they are really doing this to try to improve public health. So we need to make sure that that voice is included in the table and that pub the public gets to see the hard work and the difficult path it is to actually develop some of these drugs and vaccines. And one of the things that I would add to that uh, is just that for too long, you know, the sort of the scientific world and the non-scientific world have not really interacted in a, in a, in a fulsome way. So I think that one of the key things that scientists and the public, and when I, I say public in general, non-scientists need to do is actually engage with each other more um, because it's, it's for too long, science has been sort of seen as being in the ivory tower. And I think we need that engagement in order to make sure that um, this is a public dialogue in which everybody can participate. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something that um, there's lots of opportunities for scientists, including very young ones, to get more involved by um, through internships, like with the AAAS and other organizations in policy work. And uh, the 
the federal agencies and the, the federal government as a whole really needs, um, needs a lot more people to step up and become part of it and bring their diversity of backgrounds and experiences uh, to help out. And so um, I, I know what a struggle it is to encourage people to apply for these rotating positions that we have at the federal science agencies, but they're transformative. I took one when I was uh, young as NASA's chief scientist and it changed my course from research to a policy uh, event and becoming much more involved with how to, how to give back and how to include uh, more science in the political realm. So there, there's opportunity abounds, but you have to want to do and, uh, and think it'd be interesting to at least try it out for a while. Amen, as a former AAAS fellow, couldn't agree more. <laughs> And I'd also like to add, I think that it's really important that, you know, I think that in the political world, we see a lack of um, expertise from the people that are in office, from the people that are, you know, even at like your local city council meetings and things like that. And I think civic engagement from the science community is really important um, to make sure that our elected officials are staying on track with what the science is saying. And as someone who is sort of similarly to you, um, Francis, is like, um, you know, in sort of the sciencey area, but also the politicsy area, I think it's really important that, that our politics are informed by science. And, you know, I think we have to continue to advocate for that. I would love for it to be automatic, but I don't think that uh, everyone necessarily trusts science all the time. And, you know, when we're dealing with climate change and the distribution of vaccines, that is really important. So, you know, make sure you guys are, of course, doing the proper science work, but that advocacy component, that civic engagement component, the storytelling component as well um, is all super, super vital. Thank you. Our next question comes from Shirley Mertz, who asks, since it is likely that more than one vaccine will be available in 2021, how will the average citizen decide which vaccine to take? I, I can jump in on that one and let's see what want to save you since, since Jay and Jay is in the way. I'll tee it up for you, which is we're going to need more than one. We're yes. going to need many vaccines. And it's fantastic that we have so many shots on goal. There are going to be some vaccines that are more amenable to certain populations more than others. There are going to be some, for example, the elderly sometimes struggle with making a robust um, immune response. And so vaccines that include adjuvant might be the route for them. There are going to be ones that need a single dose um, as the J&J &J one is, as opposed to a dual dose vaccine for ease of administration. Some of them are only stable um, at minus 70. Some can be frozen. Some are stable at room temperature. So as we think about immunizing the globe, we're going to need lots of different technologies to get to the finish line. And Seema can talk from the front lines. Yeah, no, I think you 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 said it really well. I think we'll need as many vaccines as we can get, and you know it's it's okay that they are all of different types because it'll different things will be appropriate for different populations, but also in different circumstances. So, as as Michelle said, the J and J vaccine, just as an example, is a single dose vaccine and can be stored in just regular refrigeration. It does so from a distribution perspective, especially in the underprivileged. Um, and under-resourced um, infrastructure challenged places, this will be an easier um, thing to get to people uh, as an example. So we will need all of those. And then the, the, what will end up happening is that some of the very high tech kinds of measures and kinds of vaccines that are available will probably be appropriate for environments where high tech can be supported and then the low tech ones will probably end up being places where low technology is what is required, simplification is required. So we'll need all of them. Great. Um, I'm gonna pose two questions that are slightly different but very related. Lee McIntyre from Boston University says, my concern is that despite all the great innovation and breakthroughs in science, we are hampered by science denial. Does anyone know of governmental, academic or industry efforts to combat science denial? And also Adam Houston asked, what's the best strategy for increasing scientific literacy and who should lead that effort? Well, I'll, I'll start with um, the scientific literacy part. As far as the denial, um, 
you know, I've, I've talked a lot about this in the past, but it's, uh, you know, the, the, the small, uh, it's not exactly a small proportion, but the proportion of people who deny that um, science has relevance to their lives and stuff. I mean, those are not the people that we want to address. I think the more positive aspect of the question is on science literacy. How do we uh, uh, embrace all the potential people out there who, from and prevent them from becoming science deniers in the future because they don't uh, they don't know very much, and and there I think it's the responsibility of just of of everybody at the state level. And I thought a lot about about the states more, more recently and their responsibility. There's tremendous opportunity to uh, work with the um, the teachers and the the universities in a state with the governor of the state and put that on the agenda that science literacy is really really important. And I'm glad that through the election process that there's been so much emphasis on the importance of science and I think just all, all the way through that with uh, all kinds of um, organizations obviously with the federal government and the federal science agencies the office of science and technology policy the scientific societies um, but we, we all need to encourage everybody to become a part of the science literacy uh, agenda. And I personally am so thrilled that with many of us have teachers in the family, I have several among my children, uh, that, that they are um, really tuned in to the importance of science literacy for the, the young ones that they teach. Because only in that way can we uh, mitigate the, the uh, people from becoming science deniers later on. I apologize. I was always going to have to leave at one, but it's been such a wonderful conversation. It was wonderful to meet with you. Thank Bye. you. Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. So I'll just say that we need to make science sexy or whatever we want to call it. We need to make science um, more appealing. It has just been a discipline which has been associated with difficult to understand words. Um, difficult to understand concepts and and difficult to access people, quote unquote. And therefore, I think if we can make science much more sort of lay, even in the language we speak, in the media, in the images that we um, portray of science, uh, that'll be a good start. Uh, but in terms of really making it something that is an accessible to all, and not feeling like it's the privilege of a learned few, um, that shift in mindset is I think what we also need. And I hope that the next generation will play a big role um, in making that happen. And it's I can good. say as the young person here, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that how we tell these stories and the ways we tell these stories are, um, are expanding and changing. And that gives me both hope and fear. And I'll start on the on the hope parts um, because right now I think that you know when when you see social media we all have a voice we all have the ability to sort of put forward our opinions to tell stories in our own way and I think science needs to be a part of that and we need to encourage people who are learning science even if they're in high school to start bringing those expertise and those ideas into other fields and into other forms of storytelling and I think as we're sort of going forward we're seeing different entities coming together so even my work is in sort of policy stuff, voting, as well as climate, um, you know, but as we've been doing that, we've had the ability to work with like fashion and celebrity. And, you know, we recently had the ability to do a takeover of V Magazine. And here's our cover with Taylor Swift um, and a bunch of other people who are talking about voting and the importance of civic engagement, getting out there and literally reaching millions of people online. And so I think we need to think about how we can change our modes of storytelling um, and bring together these different sectors so that at every level, people understand what's happening with science, what's happening with coronavirus, what's happening with climate change. Um, I'm also a little bit worried from that same system because, you know, we've seen massive, massive distance information online, particularly on Facebook around coronavirus and, you know, putting a little flag on a post that's like, here's a link to the CDC is only going to be so effective. And so I think it's really important that as we move forward, we start um, taking action to sort of stop these echo chambers from developing online that are allowing the sort of breeding of these subcultures of people who are anti-vaxxers, 
or who are against science or don't believe in climate change. I think it's important to that we um, take action on that and you know continue to um, allow for real science to be integrated into our communications. And I'm hoping that what's happened as a result of this pandemic is people care what scientists have to say. People want to know where Dr. Fauci is and you know what's up. So I think it's important that we continue to see more efforts like that uh, and more integration of science into really all aspects of our society. Yeah, it was nice to see Dr. Fauci on the cover of InStyle magazine as an example. So <laughs> <laughs> talk about popularization of science. That was great. Yes. Great. I, I see I see a question by Ed Sarver, and I know there are so many questions and some of them may, we, we just won't have time to answer, but I, I just think it's such an incredibly important question. I wonder if you mind if I just read it. Uh, is that all right, Aaron? And everybody? Go for it. Um, over 70 million Americans supported a candidate who opposes all that is being said. How do we reach those people? Well, I, I, I personally wouldn't think that there are 70 million, there are 70 million people who think one way and 75 um, or so million people who think another way. So I'm not sure about the first part of that sentence, but, but it is really clear that there's a lot of people that have to be reached by the kinds of things that have been said here. And, and that's something that for me personally in this whole election experience, that's what struck me the strongest because my, my whole life is involved in science and engineering and with, with people like that are on this call and that are listening to it. And, and I, I think that this, is, this election is an invitation to us to address that question. And, and I personally am gonna spend a lot of time thinking about that and devoting myself to education and to outreach and to reason. I uh, have Hispanic heritage. And it, as you know, this was a very complicated election with respect to the Latino, Latina pop populations. And um, they're not a homogeneous population. There are millions of them and increasing. And, and I feel very much when I think of my now deceased parents that that's, that's just a way that I would like to, and each of us has a personal thing that we can step up to, that, that I think this election has not changed our course, but it certainly redirected us a bit to, to reach out to people that do not, um, perhaps haven't enjoyed the, the access, the, the, the outreach that we have enjoyed. And once upon a time, we were those people as well. And, and I, I know I came into science late uh, because I didn't have access and then I, then I was able to get it. So um, I, I just think that I thank um, uh, uh, that person for the question. And I think that's something we all need to turn our minds to now that the election is over. And I would add to that, um, you know, I think that when you look at every poll looking at sort of what the public wants on the public Democrats and Republicans, majority of each side want action on climate change, majority on each side want a vaccine and action on coronavirus, right? So I don't think that um, like believing in science necessarily falls along party lines, even though you might see certain messaging from certain leaders. And I think that it's really important that we that's why it is so important that we continue to push and engage on these issues um, because there is a fundamental disconnect in our democracy between what the public wants and is in favor of and what our elected officials are actually willing to put forth and make into law. So that's why it's really important that, like it's more important than ever to actively vocalize your opinions, contact your representatives, contact uh, you know your local officials and let them know what it is that you actually believe. Because at the end of the day, what our politicians will put forth is what they think will keep them in office. And so you know it's up to us to actively advocate for the science. Science on its own doesn't advocate. It just is the reality of what's happening. And so we have to be the ones that do that work and push it forward. And if you're looking for how to do that, you can and um, join us at Plus One Vote or donate to our organization. I'll put a link in the chat. But you know, I think it's really important now that we get engaged and actively use that science brain power that we have and translate that into policy making. Thank you. And we have one last question uh, from Paul Misiewicz. 
How does science innovation proceed with the social distancing and other limitations posed by the pandemic? And maybe Dr. Derisi, could you kick us off with an answer to that one? Yeah, so um, yes, it can. You know, there are a lot of uh, safety precautions, SOPs you can use in the lab to safely work in the lab. We've been running a lab 24 seven since March at full tilt and, you know, knock on wood, we've had no incidents. And that's because we have very strict mask wearing, very strict distancing. You know, you can't have people in the same room and all that. And you can, you know, with clever strategies and time and, and sort of revolving schedules, you can actually get quite a lot done, even with strict policies in place. It just requires you to be a little bit more clever, a little bit more thoughtful about how you deploy your personnel and how they work together but it should not be an obstacle to getting the task done. Great. Any closing thoughts for us uh, in our last two minutes? The future of science in America. Well, I'm hopeful and it's been great being here. Yes, I, I think that if we can work together the way we've worked together as scientists and collaborators across all sectors, um, you know, as on the pandemic, you know, we could do great things for the future. And I think that, you know, science is for me something that's always given me a lot of hope and a lot of solace and just knowing that there is sort of an objective reality and this like inherent curiosity to everything that's happening around us. And, you know, of course, we're talking a lot about the implications of that science from coronavirus to climate change and all these other issues. But there's a lot more science out there, you know, and I'm hopeful that in all these different fields from whether it be astrophysics to botany or whatever, that, you know, we continue just engaging with science because I think it's important and that we keep exploring the world around us and uncover the mysteries of the world. So thank you guys for joining us. On that note, thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers and to everyone who tuned in and, um, Feel free to follow LeapsMag and the Aspen Institute Science and Society program. We both have a newsletter and we hope to do more events together. So please uh, stay tuned and we hope to see you all again. Thank you again so much. Bye now. Thank Thanks everybody. Thank you.